We are in the... Oops, hold on a second here. Sorry about that. Welcome everyone to another episode of UFO Man Live. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about uh, military encounters and information from uh, military officials, first-hand knowledge, second-hand knowledge, and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to introduce my panel, starting with Tommy Highway. Hello folks, I'm Tommy Highway. I'm a ufologist, I'm an author, I'm an engineer. Uh, really happy to be here. We got a great show for you tonight. There's all kinds of UFO interactions with the military. We're going to be covering just some of those tonight. Got a great show for you and welcome aboard. Thank you. Thomas. Good evening, everybody. I'm Thomas. I'm a, a ufologist as well, ancient, ancient alien theorist, a potential uh, young child ad, abductee survivor, um, you know, game developer, and even, in, uh, what do you call it? Um, found the uh, invisible dot in adventure many years ago at Atari. So, Let's have some fun. All right, aren't you also involved with CE5? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Welcome everybody on the panel. Welcome everybody in the chat. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, World War II. We're going to go back to World War II, and we're going to talk about Foo Fighters. Tommy, what do you know about Foo Fighters? Well, at, all throughout your uh, the European theater specifically. Uh, there were rumors and even photographic evidence of World War II fighters on, on both sides, both Axis and Allied powers, being harassed essentially by unknown craft. Craft that were uh, very, un their, their design was something that was way far ahead of anything that was actually flying at the time and their maneuverability, things like that. Um, it was the same old story, though. A lot of the pilots and gun crews of the bombers and all that were very reluctant to come forward with the stories of these things because they didn't want to sound like they were crazy. But then again, they couldn't exactly ignore it either because they didn't want to ignore a potential super weapon from the other side. So it put everybody kind of in a precarious position. But that's actually where I think um, pretty much the birth of ufology kind of sprang from is, is the, uh, the Foo Fighters of World War II. Another thing about Foo Fighters, Foo stands for foreign observable objects that's what foo stands for so that's why they call them foo fighters um the objects uh were at one time alleged to be possibly of german origin uh because the germans were working on a a uh, round drone that could be piloted by one person uh but they were unable to get it down to the size of the Foo Fighters that were being photographed by gun cameras on war planes. It was impossible for them to be German origin, so they had to be something other, something unknown. Okay, we are going to play a video clip that has no sound so that we can comment. Um, these are pictures from World War II uh, showing the Foo Fighters. Nice. Here we go. All righty. Okay, this is from 1940. 
you got any comments on the panel, please? Yeah, they look, you know, it's you you look at the clarity of what's going on in the of the uh, fighter in the foreground, but in the background you can see you've got definitely three bright object, four bright objects running in formation behind this. So it's yeah. uh it's great to see we've got, you know, images going back this far. Well, think about it like this. If you were um let's say if some sort of uh a historical archaeologist or something like that, whatever, and you were tasked with observing, uh, you know, a people, observing a planet full of, of a particular species, what a great show. Watch their world wars. I mean, yeah. think right. about that. you know, that would be, you're going to learn a whole lot about a species by watching the way they kill each other. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it, it seems like the lights were acting like they were curious about yeah. the plane and about how it maneuvered and whatnot, because they would surround the plane and follow the plane and pace the plane and be in front of the plane. So they were going all around it. Here's another clip. 1939. Here we go. Another triangle formation. Yep. Here's 1939. There are three, but you can't see the bottom one. It's kind of, here's 1942 toward the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Are those dark objects, the fighters? And there we go. Yep. There's the white ones again. Interesting. 1942. Yeah. I mean, it's similar to what we're seeing today in orbs. Sure. It's just the energy of, of what these ships go and create. It's such a high energy field that they create. It just, you know, pushes up the, 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 into the visible light spectrum and yeah. creates plasma. Yeah. Yeah. There's a dark and radiation. Right there. But, okay. Here we go. 1940, over an airfield. Mm -hmm. There's three right there in 1940. Yeah. There's one in 1940. Now, That's this one, this one here was actually thought to be of German origin because yeah. of its size. It almost looks like there's something in the center. Um, almost like a bell shape, kind of. Yeah, it's just, yeah, almost bell-shaped, yes. Because wasn't 19, there... 19, Renee says. Yeah, it wasn't their uh, facility they found where there was, like, they were calling it the German bell or something like that that, that, that they had at that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, de Glock, but I don't know if that's de Glock. It could very well be. Now, let's go a little far further forward in time. We had the... Uh, Battle of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That was on February 24th, the night of February 24th, the morning of February 25th, 1942. Searchlights and any aircraft guns comb sky during the alarm. Now, we all know about Battle of LA for the most part, but what is unknown is there were over 2,000 shots fired at it. Uh, people on the ground, soldiers on the ground said that they heard the shots hitting something that sounded metallic, uh, but nothing was brought down to the ground. Nothing crashed. Uh, if, if it were a balloon or if it were anything terrestrial after firing 2,000 rounds of high explosive ammo at it. I mean, and this stuff is so nasty that when it did land in neighborhoods, it actually killed some people. Um, and, and nothing brought this thing down. So, I mean, and look at it. I mean, just, yeah. you, you know, it, it's really kind of hard to deny that. Yeah. Too many people saw it. You know, the U.S. government at that time could bring out as much disinformation and try and call it something that it's not. But realistically, you know, anything that's going to take that much fire and just kind of keep on moving around and act like it's nothing, that's some good technology there that was way beyond us at that time, Absolutely. even today. Mm -hmm. Right. I got some better pictures of it. Let's see here. Come on. Here's the original photo. Kind of hard to see what's in the light beam in the middle, but I do have a better one after that. That's an original photo. That's really clear. Wow. Here is the negative showing what looks like a disc at the aperture of the lights. Definitely something in the center of that one. Yeah, and you can see the explosion of anti-aircraft gunfire above it. There you and go. And here is a caricature of the actual craft. And why I think this might 
All right. I think this might be German uh, technology and maybe not. I don't know. If you look at the Hanabu, which is right here beneath this German Zeppelin, okay, it has the same shape is what was showed in the Battle of Los Angeles, yeah. almost, except for the top. And if you look at this disc right here, that's to the left of the war plane, that's a Hanabu, you're yeah. going to see that it kind of has the same shape as what was seen above Battle of Los Angeles. Now, this wasn't, obviously, but this is a Vril, a Vril flying saucer, German, with a German war plane. What I want to say about this is when there were a lot of UFO sightings, there were a lot of flying saucer sightings as well. And some of them were probably man-made reverse engineered craft from the Germans. Mm -hmm. There's two warplanes with German disc. But I have to say the shape of the ship, then that one right there and from Battle in L.A., that really looks like a gray. I mean, because if you look at a lot of the different uh, recent drawings of where they draw the ships that have the grays that came down and landed in the schoolyards and kids drew pictures of it, looks really yeah. similar to that. But what I'm getting at is if you look up here at yeah. the top and you see it goes straight up and then it has like a dome with a point, yeah. okay, that looks a lot like uh, the top of this craft here. See how it goes up straight? Yeah. There's no point, but it goes up straight. Yeah. So there is some similarity. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to go out of here. Let's see here. I'm done with that. Okay. So uh, what I want to say is um, <clears throat> Foo Fighters and um battle los angeles were most likely extraterrestrial we think we we had a, a discussion before the stream and we we tend to think that that's probably the case um but then again like i said it does resemble the german saucers but then german saucers were reverse engineered from alien technology so that would prove that case right there okay tommy you said you had a monologue about some sightings in vietnam we're going to go a little farther ahead in history we're going to skip over the korean war and we're going to go right into vietnam yeah that's right tim i do um it's very interesting because there were several major incidents in vietnam regarding uh, ufos unexplained phenomenon and uh in, in craft essentially that were not only observing, but sort of interacting with uh, some of the things that were happening during the, these battles. Now, one of the things in particular is apparently occasionally um, they would get a sighting and they would report the sighting over the radios as an enemy helicopter sighting. OK, and, and this was actually fairly a common thing. We're talking about out in the ocean. The aircraft carriers are talking about in country and everywhere in between. It was so common that, again, they, they had a term for it, enemy helicopters. But here's the problem with that. The Vietnamese didn't have helicopters, not one. They didn't have those to, to fight with. So who were the enemy helicopters they were talking about? Well, when you, you listen to a lot of the uh, old Vietnam veterans, especially the intelligence guys and people like that, excuse me, they, claimed, they seem to claim that enemy helicopters was basically a term for UFOs. And that this happened all the time. There's one incident, and let me go, let me go into it. The HMAS Hobart, which is an, an Australian, um, basically, warship, a small warship. I think it was like a little destroyer. And it was actually hit by two to three uh, anti-aircraft missiles. Now, think about that for a second. A ship in the ocean hit by anti-aircraft missiles? That's weird in and of itself. But the real story behind this is, is that they, they encountered some of the uh, patrol boats out there on the Mekong Delta, and they encountered a UFO, some kind of large orb in the sky. They began shooting at it, things of that nature, and their bullets, their, all the rounds, everything they were shooting at it began to come back at them almost like it was a ricochet effect, okay? So they called in a couple of, of fighters. They came in, and one fighter fired two missiles at this thing, and the missiles essentially just disappeared. And then this thing just leisurely flies off like it's no big deal. Well, several hours later, out of the blue, 
the USS Hobart was actually hit by those two missiles that were fired from those the, the, that fighter plane. I mean, they, they did a whole examination on it. They know what hit it. They know exactly what type of missile hit it and all that. They just they can't they couldn't figure out who actually fired the missiles until they went back four or five hours into the previous night. Then they get the story and they realize that these missiles were fired at this UFO and for whatever reason struck this ship hours later. And I mean, this is a known thing. There's several sailors that were killed uh, in the uh, incident. And, um, you know, that they've even introduced or rather interviewed one of the fighter pilots that was like on the mission that night. And he, he even goes into it and says that, you know, we fired the missiles and they were just gone. You know, this thing just disappeared. So think about that for a moment. I mean, they, there's there's all kinds of we didn't really cover the Korean War, but there are all kinds of stories about um, flying saucers and different kinds of things in the Korean War as well. We just couldn't put it all in, you know, in one place at the same time. But this is happening. I mean, they are harassing our military. Well, have been, have been our, our military is harassing them if they're fighting if they're firing missiles at them. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a more of you know we're gonna you know fire some missiles at them, grab them, pause them in time. Mm -hmm. Let's take them, shift them forward, and yep. give you back some of your own medicine. Three hundred miles away. Yeah. Think about how you're going ahead and treating us, and we'll treat you better. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Okay, we're going to get into a video now. The video is firsthand knowledge of alien visitation presented by Brigadier General Stephen Lovekin. Uh, Stephen Lovekin was actually part of the regular U.S. Army, which is an all-volunteer army originally. Um, so just to clarify that fact. Um, and I know this because I was in the regular army and I volunteered, so that proves the point. Um, he's going to talk about his connections with Roswell, uh, the uh, recovered bodies, the uh, materials recovered. He's also going to talk about his uh, contact with Dwight D. Eisenhower and how he got firsthand knowledge from Dwight D. Eisenhower in regards to different types of uh, alien vehicles that the U.S. government was in possession of. He's also going to talk about other White House uh, contacts that he's had. So... Let's get this video going. Let's go here. Here we go. School, mm. which is a private uh, coeducational prep school in Philadelphia, in 1958, and went into the military after. Going through uh, advanced infantry training, I was transferred to the Pentagon, where I worked for the Radio Frequency Engineering Office. I finished there, and I joined the White House Army Signal Agency in May of 1959. Uh, I served under Eisenhower uh, from May of 1959 until he got out of office, and then I served under Kennedy until uh, I left the service in August of 1961. I worked with a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Holloman, and I can't think of his first name other than the fact that I think it may be Earl, but I can't, I, I can't swear to it. Anyway, uh, my job was to, uh, was to learn how to deal with code, and that's what I did. And when the process of, of dealing with that uh, through military uh, maneuvers, uh, I uh, learned a lot about Project Blue Book. Uh, Blue Book was discussed quite openly in the office. Uh, sections of Blue Book were open for discussion. And uh, then there were other matters as well that, that were brought to uh, our attention one afternoon when, when we uh, were just about ready to finish up training. It was about 3.30, maybe quarter or four in the afternoon. Uh, Colonel Hollibird brought out <clears throat> a piece of of what appeared to be uh, a metallic, uh, it was a metallic piece of, looked like about a, it looked like a yardstick. Um, it, uh, it had uh, deciphering, it had, it had the encryption on it. And uh, the encryption was pointed out by Colonel Hollibird uh, to each one of us who were in the, uh, in that class, and I think there were six or seven of us at that time. 
And uh, it was uh, told to us where that came from. And this was in, in uh, connection with Operation Blue Book. What they were trying to say is, look, we've, we've got this, this physical information, this physical uh, property. And to, to go along with what, what you've seen in Blue Book, we have now been able to get our hands on and show you uh, materially. And that's what, that's what he did. They went on to further explain that, that this was the material that had come from uh, the New Mexico crash in 1947. And um, <clears throat> that was discussed. Um, I think it was discussed at length, if I'm not mistaken. We, we spent perhaps another hour or so. We left about an hour late that afternoon. And, and the next day it was discussed again. They did discuss the fact that there were bodies. Extraterrestrial bodies, yes. Um, there were either three or five, and 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 they didn't even know at that point, uh, because some of the uh, some of the information that they had gotten apparently was was incomplete. But three or five stands out in my mind as as the number that uh, that were taken. Uh, they were one was alive, uh, partially alive at the time that uh, this happened, and I do not know what may have happened to him after that. Um, but uh, the Army Air Force uh, was, or the Air Force at that time, was very, very much concerned about Blue Book. And there were strict uh, regulations involving anything that had to do with the reporting of a UFO uh, or uh, talking about a UFO. If you wanted to ruin your career and it was told to us I was an enlisted man. I was the lowest, the lowest thing uh, down on the totem pole. And, and it was made clear to us that if we wanted to mess up our career, uh, the thing that we could do the fastest was to talk about UFOs, <clears throat> that we were being groomed for top secret and above, and that, uh, and that we, uh, we certainly would not be cleared for any kind of, of confidential material should this be released. Uh, you saw an awful lot. You saw a lot of little pictures. Uh, most of the pictures we have seen duplicates of today. Uh, some were the pictures that I saw were, I think, uh, maybe uh, a little bit better. Uh, they were taken by uh, Air Force pilots These as well pictures of, of the UFOs. Yes. So they actually had pictures of UFOs in these. Oh, places. indeed, they did. Yes, not only the Air Force, but but uh, some were taken by civilian pilots. Uh, some were taken by uh, uh, Marine Air Corps uh, pilots. Uh, and, and some were foreign. And it was, uh, it was made quite clear that, that, that there were a number of others that, uh, that were in place in other agencies that were being used at that time that were not being put in the Blue Book. I inferred from that that perhaps those pictures were better than the pictures that they were showing us. It was kind of grayish foil-like, uh, maybe eight to 10 inches long. I can't remember. Uh, it seemed giant-like when I saw it because it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this before. And, and all eyes uh, were, were just peeled on that particular thing. And when he told us what it was, it... Uh, uh, it was frightening. It was eerie there. You could have heard a pin drop in the room when, when it was first mentioned. And what did he tell you it was? Well, he said it would, had been taken from one of the craft that had uh, crashed in, uh, in New Mexico and that it had been taken from a box of materials that the military was working on. Uh, they didn't use the word uh, reverse engineering at that time, but the, it was some, something similar to the reverse engineering. Uh, they felt like uh, uh, they uh, they needed to work on, and it was going to take years to do this. Uh, I do remember that there was uh, that at the uh, uh, at the Army Engineers uh, Fort Belvoir that that uh, uh, that they were doing a lot of experimentation at Fort Belvoir, and that surprised me. It, it, it surprised me an awful lot. Well, they look like hieroglyphics. Um, it's hard to describe hieroglyphics, but, but um, if you've ever seen any ancient Egyptian writings, you, you know that um, 
uh, that the the hieroglyphics were animated in some form, and these these appeared to be animated. And if I knew, you know, the code that was supposed to be used to to find out how this language was to be interpreted, then I it, it was very expressive. You could tell it was expressive. He had a stainless steel box with a lock on it. Um, almost like a carpenter's box, but maybe bigger. And that's where he got this from. And that's where he put it back. And I gathered that was not the only thing that was in that box. Uh, but that's the only thing he did show. I were, This was in the radio frequency engineering office. I did not have any more contact with, with uh, the subject matter of UFOs until after I came in contact with the president. And uh, then I had heard that he did an awful lot of doodling on paper, on uh, notebook paper, particularly at conferences that he wasn't particularly happy with. And he would take to doodling. And one of the things that he did, he did doodle uh, were uh, various forms of UFOs. You're, you're referring to him? Now. President Eisenhower, yeah. I never saw Kennedy do this, but President Eisenhower did it and he did it in my presence, as well as several other people who, who were uh, attached to the White House Army Signal Agency. We had one instructor, a Lieutenant Colonel, and his, his um, I guess his job was to not only teach us, but to make us believers as well. And uh, that's, that's when he produced that piece of material from the what appeared to be stainless steel box. It was a, maybe a, a kind of a dusty gray like uh, foil that may have been burned on, looked like it may have been burned on a, on a grill. Um, it was made clear that he, that, that it was inferred that that was not the only piece of information that he had or that the only, the only object that he had, he had several others. Maybe the whole box was filled, I don't know. But that's the only piece he filled out. And the reason he did this was, was to make sure that we understood we were dealing with something that, that was totally out of context from, from what we had been dealing with earlier and but that we might be dealing with in the future. And I think he intended for us to know that, that our futures were going to be dealing with this subject matter more and more. He did it, describe them as being symbols of of, uh, of instruction, and that's as far as he would go. But but he did in, he did infer that 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 the instructions, whatever they might have been, uh, were something that uh, that uh, was important enough for the military to uh, to keep working on on a, on a constant basis. Uh, it, he made it quite clear that that this was something that was of grave importance. We were in the basement of the Pentagon, and in those days, that was in 1959, uh, there was a tremendous amount of security there in the basement of the Pentagon. Anybody who's worked there knows what I'm talking about. Uh, you could almost carry on an entire war in the basement, and no one else would know uh, what was going on in the floors above. So that's how secure it was. I was working on top secret. I had gotten a secret, and by the time I finished the school, I uh, had been given a top secret, but I was to given I was to be given one step higher than that, and, uh, and at that time they didn't have a clearance specifically dealing with this problem. If you dealt with a problem, you got a Q clearance, which was which was a nuclear clearance. Uh, and maybe later on they decided they were going to change that, but that I remember that that was the big question: How are we going to to give security uh, to uh, our security clearances to these people who've been through this course. There were probably 1,500 reported cases at that time that were, I guess you'd say, eligible to be printed or to be put in Blue Book. And the, the, uh, the findings that were put in there were highly scientific uh, and they were highly gone over uh, by, by uh, the people that, uh, that knew it knew what they wanted to put in there. Um, this information was information that would never get out to uh, 
<clears throat> to anyone else, but it was designed for the use of uh, particular military personnel. And so what was there was, was extremely exact and specific. These cases were as bona fide as they possibly could be. They were talking about people who, who had uh, sterling reputations, either in the military or either in maybe a civilian capacity in some form or another, but, but they were not taking any loose cannons. This was, this, this was information that was, uh, it was, they they thought was extremely uh, uh, accurate. In this country during the early 50s, uh, numerous bases were built where that would allow the president and Congress and VIPs to go in case of of uh, of attack. Uh, that is to maintain the government on its. Uh, on its level of being able to function and so forth. And Mount, Mount Weather, Virginia was, uh, was one of those. Uh, Fort Ritchie, Maryland was another. Camp David, uh, uh, Maryland in the Catoctin Mountains was another. And uh, there was another one in West Virginia at that time, which we only knew as, uh, uh, as concrete. <laughs> That was the code name. Uh, Mount Weather, for example, is 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 underground. It is uh, uh, it is designed specifically to uh, uh, to be impenetrable as far as then uh, what we knew about uh, atomic weaponry was concerned. Uh, but also, uh, there was equipment up there, and it was specifically told to me. When, uh, when I first came there, I first went on tour there because we, we had to go through all these places where the president would go just to familiarize ourselves on what to do and, and how to do it. But there, there was equipment up there to, to deal specifically with, with the UFO problem. Uh, it was a standard, uh, op, it was a standard op, there was a standard operating instruction. And I don't know what it was. Um, that would have been out of my, uh, out of my category of work, but, but there was a standard operating instruction on what to do uh, with U UFOs had been sighted around Mount Weather, uh, not only on one or two occasions, but on numerous occasions from what I understand. Uh, they also have been sighted uh, in West Virginia uh, at the place I referred to as, uh, as concrete. Stories about radar lock on, yes, there were and, and Several of those stories came out of Ohio. Uh, there was right uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, but uh, several others came from California, uh, Texas, uh, Washington, from what I can recall. But I would say there probably were between two and three hundred cases of lock on, and that's why those cases were in there uh, because they were authentic. Did I ever hear that we had ever picked up signals? Which, uh, which could not be identified, or thought if they could be identified, uh, were they coming in from strange craft um, that, uh, that perhaps had given us uh, uh, or put us under surveillance? And yes, I, I did hear that. And I, I heard that from uh, numerous, I wouldn't say numerous, but at least five, maybe six reports that wound up in Blue Book. Yeah. And these, uh, in fact, several of the, of the uh, reports had come in through pilots' radios um, <laughs> when they, in the, uh, so whatever intelligence we were dealing with at that time knew how to deal with us. They knew how to communicate with us, but that they were of extraterrestrial origin. That was the belief. I was told that what they had there for us to deal with came from the New Mexico site, but there were other sites and there were other crashes. They did not say where. Uh, they were not pinpointed, but, but uh, it was made quite clear that that was not the only site that they had gathered information from and, uh, and also material. The Wright, the Wright, Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, was brought up uh, on a number of occasions uh, that apparently there were more lock-ons 
at Wright-Patterson than at any other Air Force base. Edwards Air Force Base was mentioned uh, as, as uh, uh, an experimental station. And when I, when I say mentioned in that context, I, I knew that it was, it was uh, mentioned in, this, in, the, in the area of testing whatever they had found. Uh, it was said that that's what was being done. Uh, Lock-ons had come from Edwards Air Force Base. I found that in Operation Blue Book. I was there at the same time that Philip Corso was there. I, when I first came to work for the president, uh, I didn't meet him until probably a month and a half after I'd been on board. Um, and at that time, it was, a, it was a very formal meeting. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. Right after that, I got an opportunity to travel a little bit with the president. Uh, we, uh, we did some traveling towards Florida. Uh, he loved to play golf. And I had an opportunity to see him under fire, as it were, and, and how he would handle uh, certain people that he didn't like. And when he did that, he would doodle. He was probably one of the world's best doodlers, and everybody would kid him. Uh, I wouldn't. I wasn't in a position to do so. But but the higher officers would would kind of say little things every now and then, and uh, he uh, he just would smile and he'd keep on doodling. Well, on some of those on some of those occasions, he had just been given messages or just been given information uh, pertaining to sightings or pertaining to information about UFOs. And I know that for a fact because I was in the comm center and uh, I saw that information. And when he would do it, uh, it would excite him beyond. He was just a, he was just a kid. I mean, and he would, he would uh, get so, he would get so excited and give orders like, uh, like uh, D-Day was, was happening all over again. He was very, very uh, interested in shapes and sizes and, and, uh, and what, uh, what made them go. I know that. The White House itself has a huge comm center in the basement. It's run by the Air Force, but the Army's there. Every place where the president would go, including Camp David, has, has a comm center that, uh, that deals specifically with, with uh, presidential traffic. Uh, the president would would continually on, a, on an afternoon or an evening, would continually get fed information. And it wouldn't be coming from me, it would be coming usually from, from a warrant officer. Why, I'm not sure how that works, but, but that's the way it worked at that time. Usually it was from a warrant officer, so a chief warrant officer had been in the army for probably 30 years or more. And when he would get that information, um, he sometimes would, uh, would close himself off and he would be alone for a while and then he would call in whoever he needed to call in but dealing specifically with ufos i can only remember on one or two occasions where where that information came directly from the comm center to him uh most of the time it seemed to come it was indirect most of that material when it's passed through it's for it's for eyes only and that means that if you have a direct interest in it then you'll see it if you don't then you won't. You knew that there were sightings. You knew that there were new findings. If you'd been around the president long enough, you could just judge by his expressions what he was, uh, what he was reading and, and what interested him. I mean, it's just something you, you knew from, from being around him. I would say that probably that was among his highest uh, of interest at that time. Yes, indeed. It happened quite frequently. And I wouldn't dare say how many times, but it happened frequently. What happened was uh, not one particular agency could handle uh, dealing with, with the entire subject matter, uh, dealing from the engineering portion uh, to, uh, uh, to citing information, to uh, reporting it in the blue book. The whole process of dealing with with uh, with the UFO uh, phenomenon 
uh, could not be handled anymore by one agency. And so in order to keep it alive, and I guess as cheaply as possible, it was, it was given to various and sundry parts of the government to work on. And I guess they thought that they could, they could also keep the intelligence uh, factor as, uh, as secret as possible by, by giving little agencies a little bit here and a little bit there. And that oftentimes is done with, with matters like this. But, but what happened was Eisenhower got sold out. Uh, the, without him knowing it, uh, he lost control of, of, uh, of what was going on with, with uh, the entire, I think with the entire UFO situation. But I think he was telling us the military industrial complex will stick you in the back uh, if, if you are not totally vigilant. And uh, I think he felt like he had not been vigilant. I think he felt like he trusted too many people. And, uh, and Eisenhower was a trusting man. He was a good man. Um, and I think, uh, I think that he realized that all of a sudden this, this, this matter is, is going into, uh, into the control of corporations uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, could very well be... Uh, used uh, in, uh, in detriment to this country. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. I think the, the frustration from what I can remember went on for months. Um, he uh, he uh, realized that he was losing control he realized that this this the phenomenon of of uh, of whatever it was that uh, that we were faced with uh, was not going to be in the best hands, and that that those were the as far as I can remember that was the expression that was used. It's not going to be in the best hands. Um, that was a real concern, and so it has turned out to be. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. I would say that the government has done a, as good a job through the installation of abject fear, as good a job on this as they've done with anything uh, with, uh, within the time of the memory of modern man. I really believe they've done a job. It had been discussed with me on numerous occasions. Um, talked about what could happen uh, to me uh, militarily and, and what could happen to me if, even if I discussed this as a civilian. He discussed with me uh, what possibly could happen should there be a revelation. Is that what your question was? And... Um, He was talking about being erased. And I said, man, I said, what do you mean erased? He said, yes. He said, you will be erased. I said, how do you know all this? Uh, something to that effect. And, and he said, I know. He said, those threats have been made and carried out. He said, those threats started uh, way back in 1947. Uh, the Army was given, uh, or the Air Force, excuse me, was given the uh, uh, absolute control over how to handle this, this being the biggest, um, the biggest security situation that, uh, that this country has ever dealt with. And uh, there have been some erasures. He was very convincing, and when he when he said this, and he was in a position to know. Uh, he was uh, he was much older than I, and uh, he had been involved with uh, uh, with the CIA and and the DIA both. And uh, well, then it wasn't DIA, but he was he was involved with the CIA. And so I, I he knew what he was talking about. I mean, he wasn't you know he wasn't just kidding. So I guess fear has done it. I don't care what kind of a person you are. I don't care how strong or courageous you are. It would be a very fearful situation because they, from what Matt said, 
he said they'll uh, he said they'll go after not only you he said they'll go after your family now those were his words and so i can only say that the reason they've been managed to keep it under wraps for so long is through is through fear they are very selective about how they pull someone out to make an example of and uh, and i know that's been done you can't create anything positively through fear Fear, fear only degenerates uh, the human soul and the human psyche, um, the human mind, if you will, and and that that will eventually go away. We have gotten so much momentum with the secrecy that has shrouded this subject matter that we're liable to wind up in a big fat crash. Um, I don't think that collectively we are able, at least as far as I've been able to determine, and that's granted I'm not privy to, to the things that, uh, that uh, I would like to be privy to, but, but as I see it, when, when you propagate a lie and propagate a fear of, of the truth, you put yourself in a very vulnerable position. Uh, They've been doing it for a long time, so evidently they've they've known how to do it. But at some point in time, uh, because of the interest, I think that the media has taken, there will be people coming out speaking that have never thought about speaking before, particularly about Nellis uh, and what's been going on. There. <laughs> I think because what would be revealed would totally destroy uh, uh, an economy that uh, was designed by certain uh, capitalists in this country uh, a long, long time ago to maintain them and, and their corporations uh, from here to eternity. And I think that, uh, I think oil has a special interest in seeing that it maintains its position where it is regardless of what kind of pollution, uh, regardless of, of what uh, disastrous side effects may, may have occurred and continue to occur. I think, I think that, that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with certain electromagnetic devices that, uh, that uh, uh, are powered by, uh, by sources that we, that we just don't quite understand as of yet. Well, we're certainly not advertising them anyway but that these sources would, uh, would mean free power. And free power is something that, that uh, corporations panic about. And I think this government panics about it. You know, how are you gonna tax free power? Looking at it from a, from a governmental point of view and from everyone that I've talked to uh, who knows something about this subject matter, uh, they do believe that, that uh, the sources of energy that keep these vehicles in propulsion uh, are sources of energy that that are just as free as free can be and they don't cause any harm to the environment they don't cause uh, any footprints to be left anywhere uh, given uh, given the fact that we're having a real question about how to deal with uh, the high price of arab oil right now uh, bush is is uh, as you know is trying to insist that we go into some of the Arctic regions and, and take more oil out. Uh, I, for one, don't see that as a, as an answer. I think that would, I think that would be totally with the situation with, 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 uh, with the global warming situation being what it is, uh, that would just be another, it would just be another nail in our coffin. Uh, but, at some point in time, and I don't know when that will be, but at some point in time, uh, we are going to have to be faced with, with the sharing of this information that will allow us uh, to have uh, free energy, if you will. A graduate student in college dealing with, with physics understands that, that there are certain curves where where this, this uh, speed factor does not mean a thing, uh, certain curve factors in space. Um, 
that time and space uh, take on a totally new dimension. Uh, the government knows this. It's, it's, it's foolish for them to try to make uh, the rest of us look like imbeciles and saying that this can't happen. What well, can happen? Hey, Tim, you need to unmute. What did you think about that, Thomas? Um, I thought it was freaking cool. I mean, at the end when we were hearing this stuff about, you know, big oil being behind, you know, the lack of disclosure and trying to keep everything out of the public eye and everything because they want to sell their oil. They want to find new places to get it. And more importantly, they don't want us to have free energy because um, they can't tax it. So. Right. Right, that's why they stole the patents and locked yeah. up the patents of Tesla yeah. because he was wow. going to provide free energy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I agree. What do you think, Tom? Well, I, I think Thomas is right. I mean, the, in, in, in the gentleman in the video as well, um, big money runs this world yeah. and big energy is big money. I mean, they're basically the same thing if you think about it. So if you were to take, uh, let's say, the Middle East, and if it's messed up right now, what happens when nobody needs their product, their oil anymore? Then what happens? What happens when the richest people in the world become the poorest people in the world overnight? Um, that's not going to go good. It's going to go good for the region, the Middle East, right. or anyone else involved with it. You know, anybody else's interest for that matter. So I, I, I believe that we do have zero point energy. I do believe it's it's available. I believe we know how to create it, but we're just not going right. to. And that's just sad. Uh, Stephen Greer says that we already have mm -hmm. devices that are already developed. It's just they won't see the light of day due to big petroleum. Because like you said, they're afraid of losing massive amounts of dollars over the petroleum right. industry crashing. And they think they can't replace it. Oh, they can if they phase it in gradually, but if if you go cold turkey on anything, you're going to cause damage, and that applies to petroleum. So you are correct. If we could use zero-point energy and access that from the universe, like these disks and these craft are allegedly doing, uh, perhaps um, we could change our world. I really believe that. Okay, our next video is uh, a UFO intrudes upon nuclear bombers in a storage facility at Loring Air Force Base, states Michael Wallace, United States Air Force, retired. Uh, let's bring this up here. This is an interesting story. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Had to play the intro. I'm going to tell you a, a really incredible story um, that I have firsthand information on. Uh, the story begins at Loring Air Force Base in northern Maine near Limestone back in 1975. The 42nd Bomb Wing consisted of uh, two air refueling squadrons and a bomber squadron. The bomber's uh, mission was uh, to support emergency war orders armed with nuclear weapons. I'd like to give you some background about the UFOs over Loring uh, before we get into the details of the uh, formation flight. A couple of weeks or maybe even a, as few as a couple of days before this particular formation flight, uh, a meeting was called by the 42nd bomb wing for all of the flight crews, for all three of the flying squadrons uh, to be held at the alert facility. So this was unusual. It was the first time that it happened for me and all the time that I had been there. So I was kind of curious as to what this is going to be about. So at the beginning of the meeting, a uniformed major says, listen, if you don't have a uh, 
security clearance of at least secret you need to leave. There's only a couple of people that got up out of the couple hundred people that were there. The major started off by saying, if you haven't heard, there has been a UFO reported over the base, over the nuclear armed B-52s that are on alert, over the nuclear weapon storage facilities that had nuclear weapons stored at them at this time. So it was um, very very serious situation, and that's what this meeting was all about. It's uh, hovering uh, without making any sound. It does have a few lights. It moves erratically. It can move very quickly, um, unconventionally, rapid straight line movements with straight vertical movements. Uh, can turn with the, without any uh, apparent radius in the turn, so it's a pretty incredible technology. The wing staff was pretty concerned about it, so they had notified SAC uh, headquarters. And we were told, uh, don't talk to anybody about it. If you have one of these incidents, you can talk to us, and we'll be debriefing you. But outside of this room, don't talk about it. And we're also concerned that the uh, local press is going to get a wind of all the extra uh, ground forces and the fighters that we're bringing in to help us uh, deal with this issue. So we're going to tell them that, that there's a Canadian helicopter crossing the border and, and harassing us. So I think that's pretty incredible. But that's the background for the story that I'm going to tell you. We had uh, departed Loring earlier in the day. It was a nighttime refueling mission. There were three KC-135s in this formation. I was the aircraft commander on the uh, number two aircraft in this uh, three airplane formation. Tankers formations were referred to as cell flights. There was a lot of vertical separation, a lot of horizontal separation. There was none of this, eh, we're right flying like the fighters do, like this kind of stuff. Now we were way, way vertically clear, I think a thousand feet and I don't know, half mile maybe, you know, so. Uh, it wasn't very much fun. It was just kind of boring, actually, to, to be in a formation flight in a tanker. However, the, the mission was um, pretty routine. Um, I don't remember. It was unremarkable in, in almost every way until we started back. Uh, and that's, that's where the fun begins. That's where the action happens. So we are coming back from a refueling mission somewhere south of New York, offshore a little ways. Uh, I believe it was with F-4 Phantoms. Uh, just a routine training mission for both the Phantoms and for us. So as we are somewhere close, to, I think somewhere between Bangor and Portland, northbound coming back to Loring Air Force Base, the command post uh, at Loring contacted us which was um, not routine, uh, but not completely out of the ordinary. But when they asked uh, the aircraft commander of the, the cell leader, the aircraft commander of the number one tanker, to change radio frequencies to stand by, they had an important um, radio call that they wanted to talk to him about. That was pretty unusual. So... It didn't take me long to say, hey, you know, I'm going to take one of my spare radios and go with them and see what this guy is uh, going to get briefed on. So I tuned in. Uh, number three tanker probably had the same curiosity. He did the same thing, I'm sure. And uh, we're listening to the command post telling the cell formation leader, listen, the UFO is over the base again right now. And we want you to... Uh, pass off the leadership of the uh, formation of the cell flight to the air, the number two aircraft. And then we want you, number one aircraft, to turn your lights out, turn your radios off, and uh, head straight to the base at your own discretion. Altitude, airspeed, path, whatever, at your own discretion, um, which is unusual, very unusual to hear that. Uh, incredible, as a matter of fact. So I was quite shocked. So uh, the cell leader acknowledges and says, will do. So the next thing you know, I'm getting a call from him. He's contacted me and said, listen, I just got special orders. I have to depart the formation. 
Uh, you're going to take over leadership of the cell. Let the navigators coordinate their positions when you're ready. You got it. So the, nav the navs did that. I was convinced that we were where they said we were. I could see some of the cities. I knew we were, we were close, so I trusted the nav. And off we off we went to the initial approach fix. And um, the aircraft commander of the number one tanker turns his lights off. Don't hear any more communication, so he's now radio silent. And in the moonlight, I could see his silhouette, and down he descended into the darkness, heading straight for Loring Air Force Base. I would have loved to have traded places with him. So number two, uh, now the old number three, and number two and I started to head to the initial approach fix, which is quite a way south of the south end of runway 36. Um, runway 36 lands to the north. So going straight to the base is uh, a lot faster and everything is, uh, everything unfolds uh, with that aircraft as he approaches the base well before uh, I make it to the initial approach fix. Um, I start hearing uh, tower channel frequency communications that are really exciting. Um, I've heard some combat uh, radio uh, discussions during during some bomb strikes with the F-4. So, you know, I can recognize a little stress in the voices, and, and that was definitely stress in these voices. I wouldn't call it panic, but it was, and it was bordering on frantic as they're talking about, um, did you see it? Where is it now? Which way did it go? Oh, my God, there it goes. And, and, and it's down on this end of the runway. It's over the over East Loring. No, it's it's back over the uh, alert bombers, um, and that kind of communication back and forth. Quite a few different people talking on the tower frequency. Um, I don't believe I could hear um, the tankers crew members um, chiming in. I'm not sure I would have recognized them. Maybe maybe I would have. I do know that uh, when the Tankers at elevation, well, KC-135 is at elevation. Uh, their uh, radar, forward-looking radar, has like 240-mile range. I'm not sure what it is. It's substantially reduced at, at ground level, and they were flying in really, really low, I believe. So the fact that they lost radar contact with the UFO in almost an instant is remarkable in itself. Uh, and then... They said, I did hear the communication say something to the effect that we've lost it. And then as quickly as the communications had started on the tower frequency, they ended. So that was kind of the end of the excitement. And um, my uh, wingman and I continued our normal approach uh, to runway 36. Uh, we broke up the formation just after we hit the initial approach fix. So I landed a couple minutes later. The uh, second airplane landed and taxied in. It is in the middle of the night. There's not a lot of uh, act action going on at the base that we can see. Um, and we proceeded to our squadron, normal, brief, pre normal debriefing room. Had a couple of beers, filled out some paperwork, and... We're dying to talk to somebody that knew anything about what it what had just happened out on the base. Uh, couldn't find anybody that either knew it or dared talk about it. So that was kind of the end of that night. The tanker that had uh, departed the formation and and uh, gone off to chase that UFO was uh, um, was absent from the briefing room when we got there. And then all of a sudden I real I remembered that, uh, well, he must be debriefing the major, the same major that gave that uh, meeting that I talked about earlier in this clip. However, the end of the story gets even uh, a little bit more bizarre. I see the aircraft commander of the first tanker. I'm not going to say his name. Um, I've almost slipped a couple of times to say his name, but I don't, I don't have permission to get him involved in my UFO story, so I'm not going to say his name. I see him walking along um, in front of the base exchange, the BX over at Lauren, I, just a couple of days after the uh, flight, I believe. So I 
pulled my truck over and got out and went running over to him and, and said, what in the hell happened the other night with that UFO? And he looks at me and he goes, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. You wouldn't believe me if I could talk about it. So that's the end of the story. And as incredible as it is, that's as true as I can remember. It's been a long time ago, but I had a lot of experience at the time of that uh, incident. And I've had a lot of experience in the cockpits after that experience, but I've never had anything as incredible as that happen. Okay. That incident over Loring Air Force Base was very typical of a lot of different uh, cases where um, nuclear sites and nuclear loaded bombers had been pestered by uh, UFO contacts yeah. uh, as if they're monitoring our progress and making sure that we uh, don't launch or, or uh, destroy ourselves. Well, what Tim, along think? those lines real quick, you know, what the importance of Roswell, we always ask, why Roswell? What's up with Roswell? Well, Roswell Air, Air Force Base is where the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb in Hiroshima was based and where they had more nukes at. So, right. Plus, right. you've got the Rendlesham Forest incident in, yeah. in, in England, and that was there were rumors that uh, UFOs were actually w looking directly at the nuclear storage facilities where the, the uh, warheads and weapons were kept. Yeah. So they're absolutely interested in in our progress with uh, with our technology, our weapons technology. I believe. Uh, oh, yeah. They are, they actually said that when we dropped our first uh, atomic weapon uh, on on the Earth is when new, uh, UFO sightings really escalated yeah. right. in the United States, especially. We became interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, what are we doing to our planet? Uh, what could we be doing to existing alien bases that are here? And or, what are we doing ripping through other dimensions as we're blowing this stuff up? Sure. Or yeah. or even our planetary system. And, and we're, we're a violent species. What Are we, are we going to bring that out to the cosmos when we get the chance? Are we going to do that? They're probably thinking that too. Yeah. Right. So weird things have happened. I have one more video this evening. It's um, UFO lands outside Fort Campbell. Aliens exit the vehicle, states Lieutenant Bob Walker. It's only uh, six minutes long, so please enjoy. Here we go. All right. Sorry, had to play the intro. And during the same period of time, NACA had an open house uh, one weekend. Uh, and I headed over to uh, NACA at one of the wind tunnels because I'm interested in aircraft. Uh, and all, and in the wind tunnel was what I described as a flying saucer. Uh, there was no doubt about the form of the craft that was there. 30, 25, 35 feet in diameter, probably uh, four or five feet in depth uh, in thickness, but then it just tapered down on the end. Went to the Pentagon for a job interview. Uh, the major that was interviewing me. Uh, brought up the subject had nothing to do with what I was doing. He said, do you believe that people who existed in that area would have a closer relationship to God than we do because of our limited in, in, intelligence and, and insight? And these people obviously are far more advanced than we are. And I thought, what's that got to do with what we're talking about? I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm coming here interviewing for a military job. And... Uh, we just kind of left it at that. I, I said, yes, obviously, I, I think so. And we began talking about flying saucers, and I got the typical uh, nebulous but not uh, evasive answers. Um, and one of the things he interviewed, and this goes back quite a while. Now, there are certain things that do remain in my memory very vividly. 
and we were talking about different aircraft and UFOs, and we were kind of blending the subject in together very nicely. And I said, you know, what about the aircraft in the future? Uh, what, what are they going to be like? And he said, we have aircraft now. Uh, he said, we, we have vehicles or aircraft now um, that we could actually fly, but they are so unique and so unorthodox, not conventional. No, you know, I guess he was referring to the fact no rudder, no tail, no wings or whatever, um, that uh, we just, uh, we don't even bother putting them out because it's the director of uh, NASA at Langley. Uh, I'm trying to date this to the best of my ability, around 56, and, oh, 57, something like that. Um, I was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, a lot of the talk that went around Fort Knox was of a, of a P-51 that had scrambled before I got there. Went up after an object that had appeared on radar and the tower had asked him to go up. Um, the P-51 went up, began describing what he had seen and then disappeared. Uh, they never found him. Uh, I don't know whether they found pieces of the aircraft, but uh, I don't recall that they even found pieces of the aircraft. I was at Fort Knox up until about 11 o'clock one night and then got in my car and drove to Fort Campbell, uh, where I had some collateral duties also. Got into Fort Campbell about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, there was a little diner that stayed open all night. And as I went to the diner for coffee and donuts that night before I went back to the barracks, uh, I noticed it was pretty full. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And the MPs were in town. And I said, you know, what's going on? If they had an air, you know, accident down or something like that. And no, everybody's really excited that a flying saucer had landed behind a nearby farmhouse. And from bits and pieces, I was just trying to pull in as much as I could. And they said, uh, you can't get there because they've got it cordoned off. The MPs have totally surrounded the property. And from what we've gotten from uh, the scene at this point, which is like 1, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, was that this flying saucer had landed. The creatures in the flying saucer had jumped over the house and had landed in the front of the house. Uh, the people in the house were frightened to death, absolutely going bananas. Um, one of them grabbed a shotgun, and as one of the creatures went up to the front door to, to, to investigate, he fired uh, a shotgun through the screen door. The people, or the creatures from the flying saucer, decided this was not a very good place to be. So they ran back out, they jumped back over the house, uh, went to the back wherever the flying saucer was located and took off and disappeared. MPs were there, and I'm sure this is in a military report somewhere. They were from uh, Fort Campbell uh, because this is the nearest, nearest base, uh, and the ones that were outside were from the base also. Uh, so they were from Fort Campbell because the state police were out there also. Uh, so if we had to track this, uh, it was in the Louisville Courier Journal and, and with somebody out there attempting to ridicule everything that's done, it makes it difficult to, to do a story and have a credible reaction to it when somebody else out there, like politicians are doing now, trying to find fault with precise words and any innuendos or anything else. So, uh, I think a lot of the people who choose stories now um, look at it I think from a monetary point of view, and I think there's some sort of an embargo uh, somewhere down the line that you don't mention this. Uh, let's just just pass on it. Yeah, it seems to me like uh, a lot of uh, UFO people have sold out. Oh, you know, um, I don't want to name any because I never know if I'm going to do an interview with one of them. But uh, there are there are a few that have done things for money lately that have, in a sense, discredited them to many. Stephen Girl. Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know why he charges as much as he does because I think it should be a free source of information. Yeah. Uh, but then again, he did give up his doctorate, his doctoring career, and he has yeah, to make right. money somehow. Yeah, sure. So I don't, I don't hold it against him that he's making money. I don't. Mm -hmm. It's just the amount that he charges for someone to go out in the field and try to do CE5 for the first time without any training and try to see ufos you know that's incredibly expensive i looked at it it was like 2500 bucks it's just crazy. crazy yeah i mean the only reason i found out about ce5 is because i was doing remote viewing with traditional meditation i mixed samadhi in and i had kick-ass effects where i was able to connect with things i was never able to before and sure enough that's the same technique he uses for ce5 so right you don't need uh shell up the big bucks there's you know there, there's ways out there you can learn how to do it without having to go to steven so what were you saying tommy well just to go back to the to the last story i thought it was interesting because i don't know if anybody remembers and this was probably the 70s because i was a small kid but there was a television show called project blue book um yeah it was like these you know, these two air force officers and it you know it, it it was a drama obviously but it went and it showed you know uh, them how they interviewed and investigated and all that most of the most of the sightings were actually proven to be false but it was interesting because one of the stories in that show one of the episodes was about this particular or uh, incident he's talking about with the aliens jumping over the house and coming up to the door and a guy shot the shotgun at him that was in there so i thought that was pretty interesting that story's been around a while actually the movie signs by m night Shyamalan actually insinuated the same thing it showed an alien that jumped on the roof and jumped over the house mm -hmm. onto the front porch so it did the same thing so maybe that has some connection to the actual event outside of uh fort campbell and what was interesting is it took place really close to fort campbell which makes you think that perhaps it was meant to draw the attention of the military so that the military could come in and have some type of contact with these beings. But the people they encountered uh, reacted the way that um, a lot of uh, mainstream ufologists believe the American public will react if a widespread disclosure is made, which is panic, fear, you know, react right away and kill something rather than you know find out what's going on you know fight or flight i think most of us would choose fight first i don't know what do you think tommy well i mean once you're being a person that's actually encountered something i mean not actually beings but technology exotic technology like that let me tell you uh, it's it blows your mind. I mean, you, you have to stop in your tracks because you have to process this, what you're seeing. And you, and you, what you're, the first thing that the human mind is going to do is just going to try to compare it to something that you already know, something you're already familiar with. And once you get to a point where you, your mind can't do that, um, it's where the fun begins. Uh, believe me. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and I've said this before on the channel, look, it, it will completely change your narrative for life. Once you realize that this is real, it's not just stories, it's not just rumors, it's not all of that. It's an actual real, real phenomenon that's happening here. Um, it just changes your your entire metric. Right. It, it changed more, my world. It changed my worldview. It really did. Yeah. We've got more evidence of this than Jesus walking on water. Yeah. You know, we have to be honest about that. So yeah. you know, you have to have you know, there's there's so many accountings, so many things people see and hear and everything, and they talk about. And you have to have faith in what they're telling us because they wouldn't be going and making these things up just to get ridicule and everything else. They're trying to share their real life experiences. Yeah. And the, the people that are risking their credibility yeah. are the ones that are ex-military, are political figures, are people that worked on black op projects. So, of course, they're the ones that you got to believe for the most part outside uh, you know, if I were to come out and tell you, hey, I saw a flying saucer out above the cornfield, you're not necessarily going to accept that as fact because I am not a military observer. I am not a police officer. I am yeah, but those stories we had government. the last couple of weeks with those farmers talking about the stuff from their perspective, completely credible, and they're not military. Yeah, 
That's true because they didn't have any access to current technology. Now, I come from an area that does. So I may have seen it on TV or I may have seen it on YouTube. Who knows? You know, the point is it's very difficult to dis to uh, discern between fake and real and for people to decide whether what whether they believe you or not is based on what you said, Thomas, faith. Yeah. Anyways, I've got a couple UFO videos to round out the evening. So let's go on to them. We haven't done this for a while. We decided to go ahead and do that. Nice. So this is one I posted, yeah, I don't know, yesterday, I think. This is over Chile. Uh, the guy says it's a plateau, and I think that means disc. I'd have to ask D.B. Cooper if he's still in the chat. I'm not sure, but here we go. Oh, look at that. Yeah. It looks like it's curved on the edges. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Tiene el destello de una, como de un platillo. Veníamos de donde la Lili y lo, y lo vi. Y dije, la niña, vamos, vamos, vamos a mirarlo. You know, I swear I've seen that in other videos, that kind of yeah. similar thing where you're seeing the lights around the edge that are kind of illuminated where you get that this kind of a shape. Well, this one looks bent in the middle like it's round. It's wrapping around something. Yeah. You can see off to the left, there's there's a really light, if you can get it back in camera, you can see it, it's almost like, yeah, where it's kind of rounded a little bit more on the edges. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are flashing lights that you can barely see it's once in a while. It, it, it's an ellipse. Yeah. Un platillo. Veníamos de donde la Lili, y lo vi, y dije la niña, vamos, vamos, vamos a mirarlo. And a lot of the light is just being illuminated because the energy of the ship, what it's generating. So it's not like we've got these lights that are up there for, you know, navigation and stuff. This is nope. just their energy signature pushing up into the visible light ring. Right. Los ovnis. OVNIs is uh, Spanish, I think, for UFOs. Yeah. Okay, just take a look at this one last Casa. time here. Yeah, they're not flares, Dylan. Um, I don't think because even with parachute flares, they wouldn't stay in one position. No, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna lose altitude. Yeah. And it's they're gonna they're gonna fizzle out too. Yeah, definitely not flares either. Oops. Plus, they don't appear to be the right color of a flare. Flares are usually yellowish, golden. Y dije la niña, vamos, vamos, vamos a mirarlo. Estoy arriba del techo de la casa. Uy, llegaron los ovnis. Yeah. Yeah, that one's cool. Yeah, very good video. That was uh, spotted on 11-22-2020, so that was only six days ago. That was awesome. Okay, this one doesn't have any frame of reference, but it was a police videotape of multiple lights over Washington, D.C. on 11-19. And I, here we go. Coming out and checking out the protests. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. I just thought it was cool because of how they split apart. Yeah. You'll see. Planet Earth, what a great reality show. <laughs> yeah. It's going to split. You watch. And that's what you lose when it's, it goes digital is all the yeah all the know, detail all the details of the brilliance that goes around the light it's probably you know 100 times more than what they're getting right now right and i think they're too there close too yeah oh wow look at that. 
More than two. Wow. It's, it's three, four. Oh, wow. look at that. Five. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Look at all of them. Holy cow. It's not one. It was a whole freaking leap. That might be a drone show, though. What show? A drone show. We we've seen some we've seen some stuff that they do with drones that yeah fool us. Okay, well I checked on that to see if it was a drone show, and according to the person that filmed it, uh, he checked on it as well, and there were no drone shows in the area. Now the other thing is this: um, a lot of people claimed, oh, it might be police lights, but I have to be honest with you, I've never seen police lights that look exactly like that. No, me no. neither. Uh, especially that start out as singular lights and then split. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. Oh, yeah. This one is UFO lights over Krasnodar Reservoir in Russia, November 8, 2020, and this is in broad daylight. Yeah. This is a good one. Что-то там вдалеке. Едем мы вот туда. Там что-то заблестело. И вот единственный способ посмотреть это вот приблизить. The reservoir is too shallow for shipping. There we go. It's там? see this this one here it would almost be reflecting off the bottom. It is. But, but it's, it's got that same look as you know that similar kind of a disc shape like we just saw in the first video. Yep. Yep. Except yeah. it's not as curved in the middle. It looks straighter. And Which what's interesting about this one is, it is, is that it's, it's broad daylight. Yeah. yeah. The, the angle of uh, whether it be more, if you want to call it rounded or whatever, depends on is, is the, the tilting of the view. So if you're seeing it from one perspective, you're going to see it more flat versus another perspective where you'd see it with more of an angle. But yeah, look at that. Right. According to the lady that filmed it, her name is Digger Girl on you on YouTube, and um, she said that uh, no people were allowed down to the reservoir due to COVID restrictions, and that the water was so shallow that they didn't even allow shipping. So that is not a ship. No. That is not a boat. There is something suspended above the water casting those lights. Oh yeah. Definitely. And again, the lights are not just lights. It's the energy being generated and just, you know, coming out in our visual spectrum. That is just amazing. Um, scratch, it is not a building. Uh, in this reservoir, there are no buildings around it. It's not a standard reservoir. It's like a collection pool. Uh, there are absolutely no buildings. <coughs> Oops, sorry about that. Uh, stop. Okay, go to the next one. We got <coughs> one more for you. Here we go. This one's interesting, I think. Here we go. Has no sound. Oops. Get it bigger. What's interesting about it, yes, it has a flashing light, but it has two flashing red lights. And navigation lights are red, green, and white. Right. And look at the shape. It's just weird. I don't understand that. Okay, let's start at the beginning a little farther here. Here we go. Now it's going to spread out. And if you look down below the object, there's another flashing red light. It's kind of like a little, little bit below, like it's flashing onto something else. Another part of the structure. You'll see it right there, down below. Yep. Right here. Yep. They don't know what that is. It makes me think it's a much larger vehicle. I think you're right.
But when I saw the red lights at first, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's terrestrial. But I don't think so because I don't know of any craft that just has. Yeah. See, no. now you see green right there, but you don't see any. They're not traditional at navigation lights for sure. No. No. And look at the shapes in the way it morphs. Yeah. And I wish we had some footage of this in IR or uh, UV just to see what's really up there because that would give us an idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. This was spotted over Richmond, Virginia. I hear a dog. Yep. Okay. So, guys, what do you think of those videos? <clears throat> Interesting stuff for sure. Um, you know, there's some definite maybes in there, I would say. Um, I think it's been a, a great show tonight. You know, we've we've talked about the military uh, messing with the – or the uh, UFOs messing with the military. This has been going on for decades. This is not a new thing. I mean, we talked about the Rendlesham Forest thing. We talked about the Roswell thing. Um, they've shut our missiles down, our our, uh, our ICBMs. This has happened in the past. Um, so the I would say that whoever these aliens or these extraterrestrials are, uh, they have a very good knowledge of of our capabilities, and they have that because they can actually come and take a look at us and, and observe us with impunity anytime they feel like it. And there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, I do believe that whoever is visiting us or whoever. It, has an existing base on earth has an agenda mm -hmm. and they're not letting us in on that agenda except for maybe the ones that made a treaty with eisenhower or a treaty with um other government officials but i had to have to say that even those government officials weren't let in on the true agenda um there have been some theories propagated to me that are very scary in regards to alien visitation, which Thomas was telling me about about a week ago. And if those come true, and I'm not going to bring it up, if it does come true, it's not something to look forward to. And that could be the reason why the government has put a lock on uh, total disclosure, because they don't want to frighten the public. Um, yeah. Go ahead, think, Thomas. You know, I think we, you know, uh, there, there's been enough stuff out there. We have the the To the Stars Academy at this point where you have Hal put off and you've got a bunch of really credible people trying to come out there and bring the information and try and bring it out and disclose it to us. There's going to be people who are trying to stop it from getting to it. But it's just a matter of, you know, I think the world is is ready for this at this point. I mean, the U.S. government has already released enough to it, and I think it's ready to you know go to that next level. Well, I can say this: I think there is a great number of people that are ready for it, but I do not believe the entire population is because if you look at the way they reacted to the George Flo George Floyd killing in Minneapolis, there is no way our country and the world is ready for a major shock to the system. Um, we can handle maybe a percentage of the population being disclosed the information, but not the entire population. We're just yeah. not there yet. Too many panicky idiots out there. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll come up with the worst uh, possible scenarios. The media would, would no doubt that for ratings, that like just like they do every day, they would uh, paint it in a doom and gloom type scenario and all of that, whatever keeps butts in the seats and on watching commercials. Um so yeah, I mean, I I don't I, I agree with you, Tim, and this is something that's been kind of a touchy subject since I've been on the channel now for as long as I've been on the channel. I'm not so sure that like just to Tim's point that we're ready for disclosure personally. And if you'd have asked me this to say 2015, I would have said, yeah, yeah, we're ready. But after the 2016 election and everything that's happened afterwards, I can't say that any longer. But really, what you're getting down to is the opinion and the way people are going to see this is how the mass media is going to spin it. And if right. they're going to do it as something wonderful and welcoming and something godlike, then we're going to see it that way. But if they want to take everything and make it a negative, uh, make everybody afraid of it and, and encase it in fear, 
when we shouldn't, there's nothing to be afraid of. They've been here for thousands, if not millions of years. Look how far they've come to be here and everything. So these are things that are, that we should be welcoming, not being afraid of. So although, just, although the media is already spinning it as if they are a threat, because look at Independence Day. That's how look, it, well, yes, but that's also the media. Yeah, true. So you look at it that way, you know, and they want us to believe it's a threat because then they can use it to draw funds from the federal government to protect us from the evil aliens that are coming to invade. You know, the false flag idea of a false flag fake alien invasion could be put into effect. And from what I understand, there is a mechanism in place to where someone can just give the order and a false flag alien invasion will go into effect with Project Blue Beam and it will convince many that we're being attacked by aliens. So with the negative narrative and the rhetoric, I don't see how we're going to welcome um, an alien life form. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that there is light and dark, meaning there is bad and good in everything, including alien life. So what I'm going to say to you is you can't be welcoming of every alien life that comes to Earth. You can't. Because if you are, you might be welcoming somebody who's coming to cook you. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying to you is be open to new experiences. Keep your mind open. Look out of the box. But be cautious at the same time. What do you think, Tommy? Well, I think that's absolutely spot on. I mean, you, you can't – we don't know anything. An alien – it's something different than anything else that we've ever encountered. I mean, we, we've encountered humans of every other type of subspecies that there is. We already know what that's all about. Now, when you're talking about an alien, someone from a completely different uh, planet, you know, the, entirely. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, who knows what these people are? Who knows what their agenda is? But I'll tell you this. Think about it like this. How easy would it be for an adult to scam a five-year-old? Pretty easy, Real easy. Right? Real yeah. easy. When you're, and when you're talking about it in those terms, you look at these aliens that if they can get here, they're probably thousands, if not maybe tens of thousands or, or higher or longer uh, ahead technologically than we are. And if when you're ahead technologically like, like that, you're also ahead mentally. So, I mean, they could they could easily come here and just BS us. And, well, I mean, it's it's been you, – you've seen television shows like the V program is a great uh, example. Remember that? Yeah. They came in peace, but they weren't in here in peace. They, they just manipulated us. Because yeah. we were easy to manipulate. We were, we're primitives compared to them. And there's that old movie, To Serve Man. It's a cookbook. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah. yeah, it's a cookbook, yeah. And they, yeah. they were giving... They're they were giving... Down. There Sorry. could be a big ship up in the freaking air right now that's, you know, in, in orbit around the planet that's, you know, half mile, mile long. And it's filled with, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, mantis. And they're here to feed because they need to grow. And that's why they're here. So it just depends on... We don't know why they're here, what's going on. But the thing is, if they are here and they are what they're, if they do want to come in that manner, what are we going to do? Put up a wall to keep them out? <laughs> no, they're, they're so far advanced of us. So, yeah, there could be good and bad. But in some respects, hopefully, the good ones will keep help us keep away the bad ones. Right. That's what we're hoping. Well, it seems yeah. to me that. There have been incidents where we've had uh, small meteorites, not meteorites, but asteroids deflected uh, by alien ships yeah. that have actually blown them out of the sky. Uh, NASA's came out and said that a few years ago. Um, and there's been other incidents as well where they protected us. Now, when they shut off the missiles, uh, yeah. the ICBMs, they actually, I think, were thinking that they were protecting us. Yeah. Or in the Russians case, they went and freaking put them in the launch mode and started a countdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, but, and then they turned them off. They yeah. scared Russia. Scared the yeah. shit out. Yep. Well, I want to thank everybody in the chat, everybody on the panel. We've had a very interesting show tonight. I hope you enjoyed our journey and uh, we'd like to see you again next Saturday. 
And uh, same time, same station, 8 o'clock p.m. Central, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Tommy. Here we go. Thank mm -hmm. you. 